those early, heady days of discovering that sisterhood is powerful, it often seemed that the only significant point for feminists was the difference between men's lives and women's lives. As if there were such a thing as women's lives or men's lives, simply understood. But if years of feminist, not to mention anarchist, activity have taught us anything, it's to be wary of simple categorizations, to be conscious that such assumptions of commonality are often false. And what's worse, that the presumed commonality often masks relationships of domination and subordination, denying the variety of our experiences and making them invisible, sometimes even to ourselves. Um, now, of course, it's the case that in recent years, whether in the feminist movement, queer movements, disability organizing, or virtually any movement for social change, the challenge has been to try to establish commonality amidst assumptions of identity-based differences. But although we may now be coming at these issues from a different angle, the question of how to find common ground amid differences, or how to recognize difference within a struggle toward a common goal, remains, it seems to me, one of the key questions for contemporary social change activists. Um, and again, I think it's one of those things that has been thrown into relief, or maybe I more accurately say should have been thrown into relief, by the difficulty of forming what would seem to have been obvious coalitions, uh, both during the Democratic primaries and even during this general election campaign. Um, where do identity differences get in the way of people being able to see common ground? So I want to say something about a concept I called uh, 25 years ago wholeness, uh, which was at the time and now even more, I think, a bit embarrassing to talk about. Uh, particularly within an academic context, we're trained to believe that some, uh, any notion like that is too fuzzy a concept to take seriously and at the same time impossible to attain. Uh, particularly in a world that has been, at least within the academic community, influenced by Foucault and his colleagues, we're all too aware of the partial and fragmentary nature of our knowledge, even of our own complex identities. And certainly in our liberal, individualist, capitalist society, we tend to conceptualize people as composed of separable parts. We concern ourselves with work-life issues, for example, as if work and life were separate and separable. Or we talk of a distinction between personal beliefs and politics, or between politics on the one hand and research and teaching, perhaps, on the other, or between my cultural, ethnic, religious identity and my identity as a woman. We may even come to believe that these characterizations these aspects of ourselves are separable. That who I am somehow can be different from what I do, or that who I am is only what I do. Uh, we may also take them to be separable in another sense. For, an, for example, that I'm a Jew in some contexts, a feminist in others, an anarchist in others, and a scholar in still others. Now, the feminist movement challenged that separability perspective in a number of senses. Uh, most dramatically, of course, the slogan, the personal is political, insisted that personal behaviors at the one-to-one -one level are related to social and political issues. That a man who claims to be committed to equality for women, for example, must treat the women in his life with dignity and respect. In our scholarship, we recognize and insist that a feminist perspective can't be hidden away to be used only in women's studies classes, but, has, but that to see the world with feminist eyes is to see the entire world different, that it has to affect everything we do. But there are other ways in which it seems to me even feminist thought has not always challenged this separable parts way of thinking. One aspect of holding such a perspective is the acceptance of the dichotomy between one's cultural, ethnic, religious identity, and one's identity as a woman, to, to the extent that there is such a thing. Um, so, for example, in, in a response to a 1983 article in Ms. Magazine discussing anti-Semitism in the women's movement, a group of well-known and committed uh, 
feminist, socialist feminists actually, wrote, the desire to reclaim the positive dimensions of one's cultural heritage is understandable. When our common enemies are so powerful, however, it seems counterproductive to engage in a politics that emphasizes the national and social identities of distinct groups, which too often attack one another rather than allying to seek redress of grievance for common concern. In other words, we are distressed that within the women's movement, a politics of identity, Jewish, black, lesbian, disabled, fat, and so on, appears to be superseding a politics of issues. We urge a renewed effort to work across cultural and social lines toward a more egalitarian society for all. Reading this reminded me of a dictum offered by uh, Olive Dalit Gordon, a 19th century European Jewish intellectual, who wanted Jews to take advantage of opportunities for education and secularization that were offered by emancipation, by allowing Jews to be uh, just kind of normal citizens of Christian society and urged his fellow educated Jews to, quote, be a Jew in your home, but a man on the street, unquote. Now, while it's true that attention to ethnic cultural diversity and racial differences have become much more central to feminist theorizing and activism uh, in the last 25 years or so, um, the denial of those kinds of differences was troubling even at the time. And now, I think we often find ourselves in situations simply where, because we are a member of X group, we are expected to act or think or vote or do whatever else in predictable ways. Such attempts to see ourselves or each other as coming in separable pieces, which can be pulled out or pushed under as the moment, situation, or context changes, deny the complexity of our identities. And that kind of denial makes it difficult, if not impossible, for us to experience that complexity, even for ourselves. It denies the interrelationship between and among the various parts of who we are, and the ways in which the totality of our lives at work is affected, constructed, and reflected by and in that totality. The process of developing an identity, however, is not an individual process. It is one that, as both anarchist theorists, such as Kropotkin and Malatesta, and feminist theorists, as well as Jewish historians, sociologists, and theologians have noted, takes place in a context. Experiencing a sense of the fullness and complexity of our identities, which is a crucial part of what it is to be human, is fundamentally a social phenomenon. I, with Derek here, I'm being a social anarchist. It's not about individuals running out and creating chaos in the world. It's about being part of communities in which we gain our being. Um, at the very least, it's a process that takes place only where there are communities which can and will acknowledge, validate, and celebrate the different dimensions of who we are. Uh, the anarchists of the Spanish Civil War era were well aware of this. Their organizing took place not only at workplaces, but in local cultural centers that helped to build on and from the very local sense of community. And when I interviewed former activists 40 years after the end of that war, there was a tremendous difference between those who had gone into exile with others and those who had remained in Spain, isolated from the community and comrades. The ones, ironically in some ways, who had been in exile, but who had been in exile with communities of other anarchists, were enthusiastic and eager to talk. The latter, the ones who had stayed in Spain and were mostly underground and isolated, could not overcome the decades of fear from which they had suffered. 